Hello and welcome to the reveal stream for Warmind, the second expansion to Destiny 2. I'm Deej and I'll be your host and I will be joined in the hot seats today by many waves of developers to talk about different aspects of this new piece of content that comes out May 8th. Uh, that will be a fitting theme for this stream, but uh, we'll tell you why in a few moments. First, I'd like to introduce you to some of the creative leadership uh, that has driven this project together. Uh, we have Evan Nikolich from Bungie. Hey. And we have Brent Gibson from Vicarious Visions. Hello. So this is an interesting milestone because we've talked about our partnership with Vicarious Visions before. Yeah. Uh, we've introduced our community to some members of your team when we were uh, bringing the PC build yep. out into the wild for the first time. Uh, but this is the first time that we have ever sat in these chairs together as partners to talk about how we can create uh, a new adventure from scratch together. Uh, so talk to me uh, a little bit about what you do in your respective studios and then we'll explore the way we've been working together. So what would you say you do here? <laughs> So yeah, I'm the uh, design director on the Bungie side for Warmind, and you know I've described my role primarily as like getting the two studios to work together, coordinate to build this product, and then making sure that you know we're staying in lockstep as we you know build the next Destiny experience. Mm -hmm. Common creative vision. Yep. Two studios. So when yeah. you take that common creative vision into Vicarious Visions, uh, what role did you play? Yeah, I'm the creative director for the studio, and my job is really to work with the entire team to make sure that they're creative ideas are making their way into the game mm -hmm. and that they make sense as a complete package. Yeah. Many developers, Lots of people. many disciplines. Yep. Yeah, we're always reminding people that Destiny is a game that takes a lot of people to make. Uh, there's no one thing that we accomplished with any one person. No, there's no. a lot of people that worked on this one and uh, I imagine they're all watching because they're excited to see their hard work being seen by uh, you know, eager players for the first time. Yeah. Yep. So, what is it like when you're working together, two studios uh, coming together and, and coming up with an idea? Like, whose idea was it for us to go to these new places and to fight these enemies and to discover new heroes? How does that work? Well, we, we talk about this a lot. And I think the thing that I like about our partnership so much is that you really don't know where the ideas begin and end. Like everybody's been working really hard to make sure that this is like a truly collaborative effort mm -hmm. and that we're all taking the best ideas regardless of where they come from to, to make the best game we can. Yeah, I mean, and that's what's been great about working with VV is that we, you know, we just started with a single goal of like we need to make an expansion to Destiny and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, working with VV, bringing in their passion for Destiny, but then also bringing the new perspectives and and a different way of like approaching uh, how we build the game and the new experiences we're creating uh, for this release. Yeah, there's a lot of things that you're going to see in this build that like are like VV special sauce. Mm -hmm. You know, there's mm -hmm. some strengths that we had mm -hmm. that we felt that would be a huge addition to Destiny as a brand. And um, so when you get through Warmind, you're actually going to see some of that stuff in the game. Yep. So we have the potential to surprise some players with some new things, but That's the goal. it's still the world of Destiny. Absolutely yeah. still oh, Destiny. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, BB's brought their, their bend to it, but it definitely is still Destiny, and I'm definitely proud of uh, what we've built here today. Yeah. What's it been like for you guys to come into this development process and to learn new tools and to you know, join us in this, in this crazy, chaotic web that we weave? Yeah, I mean, the first thing is, like, it's been two years yeah. of building this relationship, and uh, I've described Evan as kind of our Sherpa up the mountain of, like, <laughs> learning how to make Destiny, and uh, we really had to come at it, like, super hungry to learn. And these mm -hmm. guys have been amazing mentors. This is a big, complex game. There's a lot going on to yeah, it. And, and we have to, you know, there was a lot of work that went into that two years to yeah. learn that. Mm -hmm. I know that we've had a lot of people from your studio visiting us. I know that we've sent people from Bungie to go and, you know, live and work uh, among your people. So yeah. Yeah. our frequent flyer mile pool is massive. Okay. Well, you know, <laughs> it was your idea to be in Albany, yeah. New York. <laughs> So I want to talk about <clears throat> our goals for this project, and uh, we're going to take a look at some gameplay soon, but we want to set your expectations for what we set out to achieve uh, with Warmind. Um, I actually uh, encountered uh, a tweet from uh, Paris from Gamertag Radio yesterday, and um, you know, there's a lot of people in the Destiny community who are looking at our roadmap. Uh, and they're talking about the things that we want to do to transform the player experience, to enhance the hobby that revolves around Destiny. Uh, we had a long conversation about these things with members of our community uh, in our first community summit 
Uh, we're pretty happy with the way that went down, so I'm hoping there will be more of those in the future. Uh, but we are looking to do a lot of things to Destiny. Uh, Update 114 was a step in that direction. Yep. Uh, Warmind is the next delivery of content and, and transformative enhancements to the way we play Destiny. And uh, Paris from Gamertag Radio said, I think it's safe to say that we want new and exciting things to do and explore while also giving us an earned challenge for those that enjoy activities in the end game. So this May 8th, that's what a lot of people in our community are looking forward to. New things to do, new ways to play, uh, an injection of new challenges into the end game. You think you can satisfy that with Warmind? Yeah, I definitely think we're hitting uh, some of those beats and satisfying what players want. I, you know, I think you put it as like this is the next step of the where we want to take Destiny. So you know, we got all new destination to explore. Mm -hmm. We're putting a bunch of secrets in the destination we want you guys to find and tell stories about. Uh, new story and campaign, new adventures. Um, we have a new uh, end game activity uh, called Escalation Protocol that we'll cover more later today. We mm -hmm. want to challenge players. We have a new raid layer. We're bringing PvP ranking in, private matches, new PvP maps like. All up, I think we have a very yeah. uh, big package and offering here, and yeah. we hope to keep players engaged uh, for the coming uh, weeks. We've layered so many things into this game. Like yeah. I challenge players to find it all. Yeah, the, okay. There is so much. They to accept be, that yeah. challenge. Yes. Careful, <laughs> careful challenging uh, our community. Yeah. Um, so we're going to a new destination. Uh, where exactly are we going? Yes, yeah. so we're going to uh, back to Mars, and so it's a place that if you've played D1, like it's a place you're familiar with, but it's a different take on what we have here. We're called, mm -hmm. called Hellas Basin. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes place in the polar ice cap of Mars, and okay. uh, where we're discovering Rasputin Awakening. Yeah, the like Rasputin, the just leaping off that Rasputin has woken and uh, set off a chain of events solar system wide. So you're seeing like war sats raining down mm -hmm. from the sky. And specifically on, on Mars, uh, this is causing the ice caps to melt. Let's show while we tell. We're going to break live. We have a fire team on the surface of Mars. Uh, you may have been to Mars before, but this is an entirely new landing zone. So let's take a look at what we can see here. Uh, you said the polar ice caps of Mars are melting. Yep. And There's a view of the skybox. We can see our old friend Phobos in the distance. Hmm. And uh, what's with some, we've got some, some space junk raining down from the skies. And then if we pivot left, we can actually see what you were talking about. So the polar ice caps are receding. Yes, and they're uncovering a time capsule mm -hmm. left on Mars, which is Clovis Bray. Clovis it's Bray. the cradle yes. of invention. It's, yeah. the, it's the birthplace of all the technology that we know in the Destiny universe today. And uh, it also happens to be the birthplace of Rasputin. So in the distance there, you can see uh, that we have uh, a huge facility. And this is Rasputin's stronghold. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't be destiny if we didn't have public events and crazy <laughs> things happening in the Nubian <laughs> world. In the, yeah. So Rasputin uh, is on Mars. You're telling me yep. Rasputin was born on Mars. We don't want to overspoil the story elements that we're going to That's learn true. in this game. Yep. Uh, Hot take from the community. Stop <laughs> telling me everything I'm going to learn. Absolutely. Stop mortgaging the gameplay to make your streams awesome. Uh, so we are going to uh, leave a lot of the player discovery uh, and a lot of the story for the actual player experience. Uh, I'm sure you'll explain to us how Rasputin can be on Mars and in old Russia at the same time. Yeah. And uh, we, will, uh, we will satisfy all of these curiosities. I know we have plans to do that. Uh, for the time being, um, this is your first glimpse of the place on Mars where you'll be exploring, where you'll be playing. Yeah. This is where the campaign will take place. Yeah. Uh, yep. But then even after the campaign is over, you have reasons for us to come back to this place. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we have, uh, we have well, one, uh, thawing right next to uh, Rasputin, we have the, the hive. Mm -hmm. So we have a... Uh, we have a whole new frozen hive that's on destination that's mm -hmm. there to, to um, uh, challenge the players. Yep, and then like part of that hive, the Awakening, is like we have the Escalation Protocol event. Yeah. That's a ritualized public event mm -hmm. that we encourage you to play over and over again with escalating waves of yeah. difficult combatants to fight. And on top of that, we have plenty of secrets and lore squirreled away and hidden in parts of destination. And like we're really looking forward to players like unearthing that and uncovering that and learning more about like mm -hmm. the the Bray facility and the Bray family. Yep. Okay. It's been an interesting uh, construct of science fiction where you have the company 
<laughs> yeah. you have the corporation, and uh, you know you have the evidence of commerce, whether it's yeah. Wayland Utani or whether it's the Tyrell Corporation. So <laughs> right. Clovis Bray is, is our own is our own storytelling uh, fictional corporation, and we're going to learn a little bit more about Clovis Bray, including uh, some of the people that were involved in the operation of Clovis Bray. Is that Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yes, we're actually introducing Anna Bray. Anna Bray. Anna Bray. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and Anna Bray is uh, a new hero that we will encounter uh, during our adventures. Uh, this, yep. Anna Bray is, uh, she serves an important role in the storytelling as mm -hmm. well as the player experience. Yeah, she's the cornerstone of a lot of the things that we're doing in Warmind. Okay. And uh, so she'll be your friend along the adventure, she's going to be your vendor, uh, and she's going to be, like I said, that cornerstone on, on unraveling the relationship between um, Rasputin and Clovis Bray and herself. Well, we're going to actually show the prologue uh, for Warmind, and this is going to be an introduction to Anna Bray. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't want any spoilers, uh, this would be a wonderful opportunity for you to go and fix yourself a tasty beverage, because we're going to play the uh, prologue in just a moment here. Uh, before we do that, uh, I want to thank Evan Nikolic and Brent Gibson for being on stream with us today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, thanks for the work that you've done to give us new things to play and talking to us a little bit about your creative vision for this expansion. Uh, Warmind comes out on May 8th, and uh, we we'll hope you'll be right there with us uh, to help uh, bump on, into us in the wild, play some escalation protocol, and, and shoot some frozen hive in the face as they come <laughs> out from underneath these receding ice caps, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've been waiting almost two years now. We're really looking forward to May 8th. Cool. All right. Well, anything else you want to say to the Guardians who are watching? Good luck playing. Yeah. I'm looking forward to hearing the stories you guys come up with. All right. Well, with that, thank you so much for being on stream. Uh, we're going to put our next round of developers in the seats. Uh, but for the time being, this is Anna Bray. Guardians aren't supposed to investigate their past. That's the rule. But I'm not good with rules. Not when there's this much at stake. The Clovis Bray tech in that building allowed us to colonize the system during the Golden Age. We, they, sought to create peace for all humanity. Which is ironic, because they also built Rasputin, the single most powerful weapon in the solar system. Either way, it's all been entombed on Mars since the collapse. Along with something far more terrifying. So that was Anna Bray, and these are the next two developers, the next wave of creators that are going to introduce us to the things that you made. Uh, we have Jacob Benton. How's it going, Deej? It's good. Good to be, have you here. And we have Ben Womack. Good morning, Deej. Good morning. Gentlemen, uh, we're going to take a look at Escalation Protocol, which has been described as a cyclical, ritualized endgame activity that you uh, have put into Warmind. Yep. Uh, before we jump into that, give me an idea as to what you do at Bungie. Yeah, I'm a designer, so I work on uh, encounters and activities and things like uh, Escalation Protocol. Okay. And so then? I was the lead designer for this team that made Escalation Protocol, so mm -hmm. I was there to help the team succeed and get all their talents up forward in the game. People can see it. So we're going to take a look at, uh, we have a fire team all assembled to play Escalation Protocol. Before we do that, uh, here they are in Destination. Talk to me about your goals for this activity. What did you set out to create here? So the number one goal was trying to make a challenging in-game experience that 
people really wanted to come back to and aspire to finish. Mm -hmm. um, we know that the community and a lot of friends and internally we've been wanting bigger challenges in the game. Yeah, like something we can go home and play at night and like really feel challenged by. Yeah, you've heard the community feedback that maybe Destiny 2 isn't hard enough. Yes, we've heard that. We heard this it. is your Very answer loudly. to that feedback. Yep. Yeah, this is okay. one of our answers. Okay, okay. One, just one of our answers to yeah. the feedback that Destiny could be a little bit more challenging. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, anything else that you want to say about it before we take a look at it in action? Yeah, there's a couple cool features about it. Um, it uh, has a lot of the characteristics of public events that okay. you already see in public mm -hmm. zones in Destiny, um, in that if it's running, anyone else can run up to it and engage with it and play. Like we're really trying to get people to you know, join up, even if they're not on the same fire team, yeah. to overcome the same challenges. One big difference, though, is you can start it at any time as a player. Like You can walk up and start it. It's not like regular public events where they're on a schedule. Like mm -hmm. You could be running this pretty much 24-7 if you wanted to. Okay. Challenge accepted. Good. Uh, so in that case, uh, should we take a look at exactly how a player would activate Escalation Protocol? Let's do it. Yeah. All right. So we have, a, we have a bunch of people assembled in this public space, which means that they can play together, but other people can come up and play with them. And uh, with the interaction, what do we see rising up out of the ground here? So this is some technology that Rasputin has embedded in uh, Mars around uh, his area in the public zones. And whenever it activates, it draws waves of hive into the location. And Rasputin's doing this because he wants you to take all of them out before the device deactivates and the hive managed to escape. So he's trying to corral them in for you. And every single time one of those rises up, um, as you play the event more and more, it'll bring a stronger wave of hive with a stronger boss you have to fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it starts out you know, moderately easy and then ramps up uh, to get pretty, pretty difficult by the end okay. of it. Yeah. So let's talk about the structure of the event. Yeah, they just activated the event and it, uh, it plays out in waves. That's right. Yep. How many waves? So there's seven total uh, waves that you go through until you reach the end of the event. Mm -hmm. And the seventh one, it's no longer the, you know, just crashing like horde of hive. There's actually a unique boss fight that has a unique mechanic. Mm -hmm. And we're actually even one of that one more level because we have five unique bosses that are going to rotate every week. Okay. So each wave has its own boss. Right. And then the final wave has a final boss mm -hmm. and week over week, you have five of them, and we will face a different final boss week over week. Correct. And then once you've played for five weeks, you will have encountered all of them, and then and then we'll restart face, at the first. Yeah, you can again. face them again. And okay. some of the bosses drop things that other bosses don't. Mm. Um, so unique like, rewards to exactly. specific bosses. Yep. Mm -hmm. exactly. Unique rewards to this activity too. Okay. Yeah, there are things that drop from this activity that you can't get anywhere else in the game. So we uh, are seeing people who are fighting with some weapons that we've never seen before. And we've seen the Graviton Lance before, but some of the other uh, guardians uh, in this yes, fire team uh, are using weapons that are specific to this activity. Talk to me about why I would want to play Escalation Protocol if I am a lover of new armor and new loot and different ways to fight. So the weapons are pretty insane. So you see right now they're using the shotgun, Ikelos shotgun. Um, they have unique uh, perks on them. So when he takes a melee on the enemy, and then he gets a damage bonus on his shotgun for a few seconds. It feels a lot to me like Fourth Horseman in some ways, which was one of my favorite weapons from D1. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But it's kind of yeah. cooler because you, you melee to trigger it and then just unload on the guy. Yeah, and uh, so that's only the first weapon. We actually have two other legendary weapons that are unique. We have a sniper rifle, um, which has a perk called Box Breathing, where if you aim down sights long enough, um, before firing a shot, it'll then get a big damage boost to your critical hits. Okay. It's such a big damage boost, you're like, whoa, like, I can't believe I did that much damage with one bullet. And then it has triple tap on the gun besides that, so you can get some really good, like, high damage moments if you can mm -hmm. make all those shots. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that we've needed to add to Destiny 2 is specific activities that give us specific rewards, mm -hmm. that have specific perks that help us excel in those activities. Yeah, that's right. another part of community feedback that we've been hearing loud and clear. Mm -hmm. We really want to deliver it with Escalation Protocol. And the armor set is super cool looking as well. It's very like Rasputin sort of themed. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when you have the full set in completion, it just looks pretty rad. And you're only going to get that armor from this activity. Correct. That's right. So talk to me about how the character progression is structured. If I'm playing Escalation Protocol, what can I expect to earn week over week? What can I expect to earn every single time I complete all seven waves of the activity? So we have a few different reward systems that working at the same time inside of the activity. Um, one of the, uh, I think the most <laughs> desirable one, 
Uh, don't, oh, wait, the, don't wave oh, at the boss. That, that's, a, that's a high value target that's messing with them okay, right now. Okay. In the public space, like stuff collides in like, a, a really, really fun ways. Um, but so we have several different systems. Uh, when you finish uh, the wave three and five, a chest will spawn that has more kind of normal public event type rewards in it, as well as chances of vanity items that are, you only get from this okay. uh, from escalation protocol. Yeah. The most desirable stuff comes from beating that boss at the end. Okay. We have two different systems. We have those guns we I'm mentioned. I'm going to interrupt you. Oh. What do we got here? Oh my gosh. Okay, well, this is the Hive Sword. You so, may remember it from yeah. the first Destiny. Go get another yep. one. Go get another one. Yeah, someone else can grab one too. Yes. So there are these shadow rifts that spawn, okay. and uh, you have to take those out, or uh, a hive aren't going to be drawn to the to the tower, and uh, the time's going to expire. So when you go to take those out, there's a knight that spawns with a sword, and if you kill him, uh, you you can actually get the sword for yourself. Nice. And it's happening right now. And this is exactly the same sword as we had in D1 that um, fans may remember from that game. So mm -hmm. you can even like you can use a super and use a smash, and you don't want to do it on exploding thrall, probably. <laughs> but uh, um, you can also, uh, you can uh, sword glide with the Learning. melee through the air. It's exactly the same. Yeah. Um, I think it's a lot of fun, and it breaks up the encounters really well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's also actually really important, because s some of these waves are going to just take a massive majors or other like high um, difficulty targets, and they're going to just throw them at you all at once. So mm -hmm. instead of maybe using your super or some heavy ammo, you can grab a sword and you know delicately try to carve your way through them. And this isn't just about shooting hive and shooting wave after wave after wave of hive. I'm, you're seeing some interesting mechanics here. You're seeing some some things that they'll have to work together to accomplish. Uh, you know, you see. Uh, like you were saying, sort of the shadow rifts, you're seeing some of the crystals that are suspended mm -hmm. up in the air. So, you know, while we can leave some of that problem solving, some of that understanding to the people while they play, what would you tell them about some of the different complexity that you've added to the activity? All yeah, up? one of the things we've found is that um, things like Melting Point or even Tether, as they're using now, are going to become pretty critical, especially as you move into later waves. Mm -hmm. So when we've been playing it, um, we regularly will stop before the playtest and coordinate, okay, what are you bringing? Like, if I'm bringing Celestial Nighthawk, can you bring Orpheus Rig? Mm -hmm. um, and that stuff that, you know, hasn't really been needed ever in public spaces before is needed now to complete this. Yeah, when you, when you aren't running someone with a point or you aren't running Tractor Cannon with the new exotic update has this amazing yep. um, damage buff that it can give to targets, okay. you're going to notice the difference. <coughs> cool. Uh, we're, seeing, uh, we're seeing some new items enter their inventory. Yeah. Um, one of the items, he may have just gotten uh, one of the armory codes. Um, so you can get armory codes uh, during the event and for doing other things on, uh, on Mars and around the game. Mm -hmm. And you can spin those armory tokens to get a special weapon uh, during the event that you're probably going to need at some point in order to progress forward. Yeah, we call it the Valkyrie. And it's, a, it's basically like a incredible, I don't even know how to describe it accurately, but it's like a magical spear rocket launcher that destroys absolutely everything. Yeah. And, and those, armory, uh, those armory codes are going to be really important for when you're on the crux moment or time's kind of running out and you need to get that extra mm -hmm. oomph to get through a wave. And you're going to want to use it at the right time and it's going to make the difference. Should we uh, debut that weapon yeah, go on for it. stream or should we save it for the players to discover when they play for themselves? Well, grab it. Yeah, grab it. It's All almost right. too good not to use. Here we go. And we're up. This is the Valkyrie. You can see uh, the Rasputin-style tech on board. It's a melee weapon. It's a ranged weapon. And it, it only lasts a short amount of time. Um, so what, use it wisely. Yeah, use it wisely. You want to like bring it out maybe when the boss for the wave comes mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. or when a huge amount of ogres spawn, for example. That was a good moment for theatrical demonstration purposes, maybe not the best tactical moment. I, I'm, I'm not going to criticize the person playing. We're, we're showing it. We're showing it. We're showing here. We're showing and telling. And uh, I'm seeing things hidden under bridges that I'm not going to talk about. So <laughs> we'll, we'll, again, keep that promise and leave. Oh, there's the sword. There you go. Have your sword. So which wave are they fighting now? What? So they're, they're in the third one right now. Okay. Um, and there's seven total. Seven, seven total. total. And so they've been getting through these pretty, pretty readily. Um, keep in mind that we're using high-level characters right yes. now. We have had streams before where we wanted to prove the activity was hard, and what happened was our audience watched people die again and again and again <laughs> yeah. and again. We actually <laughs> started testing this out like yeah. that. Yeah, uh, yeah. We had them at like the proper yep. level. Yeah, the, the, like the level people be at the first week uh, of play. I'm sure yeah. there are people watching who attended our community summit who actually got to experience this activity, and they'll be going live after stream with their own uh, 
you know, their own analyses, their own, their own takes on what this is. We made them play at a much lower level right, because yeah. we wanted to demonstrate that this was hard. But for the purposes of this stream, we've leveled these characters up to the point where they've completed the campaign. Right. They've probably played this for a few weeks. They have weapons oh, that many drop weeks. only from this. They have weapons yeah. that only drop from this, which make them better at performing yeah. in this. So a character's first experience in this activity may be very challenging. Yeah. Failure oh, may guaranteed. be the default state when you first get started. Yeah. In fact, uh, you were talking about uh, having hang some... On, hang on. What's this? Whoa, what's this? Whoa. So uh, here oh, we have uh, Cosmo is demonstrating uh, some of the different armor that we can take a look at. And uh, the best way to show off your armor to yourself is to do some emotes. And we now have an emote wheel. I think you're a little bored with all those green emotes, but uh, we can uh, definitely get you some uh, better emotes through your commitment to the game. Oh, you can see the amazing uh, um, helmet that you get only from Escalation Protocol. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, so uh, we've got the new emote wheel. That goes in for every single player of Destiny. Uh, you know, it's one of the Season 3 upgrades. Uh, Escalation Protocol is exclusive to Warmind. That's right. That's correct. And just to recap, um, rewards that are specific to the activity. That's right. You made it real hard. In fact, yeah. what was the feedback you got at the summit? <laughs> yeah, so actually, yeah, at the, at the summit, uh, <laughs> they, you know, they were having, they were finding it difficult. But the feedback we got was that they would prefer if it was even more difficult. And we were really close to being locked down, but we managed to squeeze in one final change, specifically based on the community feedback from the summit, mm -hmm. to make it even harder. Yeah, okay. the the day of the summit, that yeah. right afterwards, Jake and I went back up to our desks and got cranking on making a change yeah. and, and getting all the right channels like involved for it, and mm -hmm. so. Now it'll be even harder. It's what people ask for. Yeah. So. <laughs> yep. Well, we're about to find out. We're about to find out if people should have been more careful about what they wish for. So uh, this uh, this begins on May eighth, along with Warmind. Uh, it must be said that you need to finish the Warmind campaign before this is even available to you. Right. Correct. Though, if someone else has actually started it, you can engage and follow along, even if you haven't finished the campaign, which, you know, you're probably going to help make a difference by being there. Mm -hmm. You're also going to be probably kind of wrecked. It's because it, you will be lower level, um, but at the same time, people can, you can, your bullets will count. So by all means. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is all waiting out there in the wild, and uh, people can dive in after they finish the campaign or during in progress if they want to get punished. Uh, we call it Escalation Protocol. Um, we will actually leave this activity now and uh, leave the rest for discovery by our players. So uh, this fire team can go back to orbit uh, for the next act of our reveal. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for the hard work that you put into this, yeah. uh, including rapid responses to community feedback in what was literally the 11th hour. Uh, glad to see you collaborating with some people in our community to make sure that uh, you dial it up to 11 at their request. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We so did it's, it. It's fun for us, too. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Um, anything else you'd like to say to uh, the Guardians in our audience before uh, we move along to take a look at the Crucible? Looking forward to playing it with everyone. Yeah. Looking forward to seeing you out in the world and doing Escalation Protocol. Okay. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for being on stream today, and uh, we will uh, talk to you again about this once we get some player stories coming at us from out in the wild. Thanks, Steve. Can't wait. Uh, up next, we're going to take a look at some updates for Season 3 uh, that are about to hit Destiny. And uh, to accomplish this, let's introduce you to uh, two combatants in our fire team that will be sparring in this live fire exercise. Uh, you should know Cosmo by now, your friendly community manager. What's up? As well as Kevin Giannis, who is a designer on the Crucible team, uh, who you going? may remember from our most recent Bungie Bounty. Uh, gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so uh, you have the comm. Uh, talk to us about what you'd like to reveal today, and then we'll get to playing some games. So today, uh, the Crucible team is going to talk to you about two important features coming in Season 3. Uh, both of these are available to all players of Destiny, regardless of Warmind ownership. And those are Crucible Ranks and Private Match. Uh, I'm going to open up with Crucible Ranks here. Um, so starting in Season 3, all players are going to be invited to the world of Crucible Ranks. And you're going to have a choice of two ranks, uh, which really dictate like how you're going to play and how, uh, what type of investment you're going to make into the game. So there is 
the Valor rank, which is a progression rank that goes up when you win, uh, or, or sorry, up when you complete matches and winning helps you move up faster, but there are absolutely no loss penalties. This is more a reflection of your time commitment. This is something you can go in, kick back, relax, and make progress towards something. So everybody can get in and uh, rank up a little bit and kind of progress through. Absolutely. Uh, and you're going to find this rank actually featured on a quick play and uh, all of our rotating playlists. Um, and then we have the glory rank here, which Ooh. is the, yes, which is attached strictly only to the competitive playlist. And this is a rank that goes up when you win and down when you lose. It's all about performance. It's all about the W's. So if you can win, if you can close out those, uh, those matches, we're going to reward you for it. What and what do we stand to gain? What if you lose? You go down. Oh. You go down. Um, you really want to stay in the game as well, because if you leave early, you're going to get hit with the loss. Um, each rank features a form of streaking, so Valor, uh, as you can win consecutively, you'll earn more points up to a cap, and that'll reset back streak down. Streak bonus. Correct. There's streak bonuses. Uh, Glory features the same type of streak bonus, um, uh, but it also features a loss streak, which means if you're losing a lot, it's going to hurt more. Oh. And that also caps out as well. Okay. Um, and that's there, you know, to add a little bit more of the risk uh, mm -hmm. of, of, of playing a competitive match, but I believe players who wanted this type of system wanted that type of, uh, that type of risk. And um, speaking of rewards... Yeah, am I getting anything other than this? You're numbers? absolutely okay. getting stuff. Uh, so starting in season, season three, we're actually changing up the way Crucible rewards work entirely. When you go to Shax, as you will be required to when you first uh, log in on season three, uh, you'll be presented not only with a welcome package that contains two amazing emblems, um, but you'll also be presented with the entire slew of rewards and how and exactly how to get them. Oh, cool. Some of them are attached to reaching ranks. Some of them require reaching a rank and then completing a challenge. Something like pulse rifle kills or hand cannon headshots, sniper headshots, redeeming engrams, uh, or resetting your valor rank. Mm. So uh, if players were to max out their valor rank, they can decide if they want to, to reset it, begin that journey anew. Uh, and that will actually be one tracked in an emblem, but also be uh, a way that you unlock certain rewards. So if I see somebody that has like 735 resets, we know that they played a lot of Crucible. Yes, <laughs> and it is uncapped. So you play as much as you want, play as much value as you want, earn as much value as you want, and we will showcase that. So these are the two emblems you get uh, for completing that intro. Uh, quest and as you see here, uh, the Valor Season Three emblem tracks the number of Valor ranks you've so completed. So I like emblems, but is there any sort of rewards that I can actually like use? Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. I'll get to that in just a second. Okay. <laughs> the Glory emblem here, for those of you who are interested in the Glory uh, rank, actually tracks your rank points in real time, which means this mm. is exactly how much you have slapped that on. If you want to peacock a bit, show off. But yes, if you want a tangible reward, there's already a series of brand new guns that you're going to get, you're going to be able to earn from uh, completing ranks and earning ranks. But there's specifically one gun each season that we're going to deliver that's going to be the, the chase. It's for season three, that's Redrix's Claymore. And this gun is unlike many guns because it features a new perk called Desperado. So as you see here, it has its barrel traits. It has Outlaw, fan favorite, which is actually getting yes. buffed in the 1-2-0 patch so that it refreshes every headshot kill. No cooldown. And Desperado, well, that's, that's synergistic with it. So reloading while, you're, while Outlaw is active is going to increase your rate of fire. But unlike other rate of fire perks we've made in the past, this one does not lower your impact, which means you're still getting the crispy three burst. You're just getting it faster. So wow, okay. <laughs> You yeah. see it in action. Yes, you will. <laughs> uh, this gun is attached to uh, the Fabled rank in Glory. So uh, for those of you who want to earn this, you have to set your sights on Fabled, make your way there. So we're not just giving that to everybody. Absolutely not. This, this is going to okay. be, I predict, one of the harder rewards to earn. If you see somebody with this, you know they're good, and you know they've earned it. So with that said, let's, uh, let's take a look at Private Match. Yes, it's back. Yes, let's it's do pretty it. insane. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Private Match is back. Uh, it's everything you have known and loved about uh, the Destiny 1 Private Match with some of our new game modes. And we've heard the feedback for, for certain about um, some of the options not necessarily fitting uh, people's preferences. So, we've, you know, we've done things like stripped out time of day uh, and stuff like that. that. So, that they're more focused on game options. So, what are we playing today? So, today we're going to be playing one of the two maps 
which uh, one of those maps is Meltdown. We won't be playing that today, but we will be looking at Solitude. Solitude is a brand new map that does require Warmind ownership. Uh, as with any uh, DLC map in private match, you need right. to have ownership to but actually if I'm playing play. in the playlist, good to go. Good to go. Uh, and that is actually a survival map. It's one we built for survival. It plays very well in survival. We're very excited. And we're going to play a little bit accelerated today. We're going to put rounds to win at two. Okay. Um, Team lives. Six, which is the playlist version. Uh, we split it up a little bit. Uh, just to get a little more snappy, but today we're going to be playing six. So we're going to play Solitude Survival, uh, and we're going to show off some new sandbox stuff. Let's do it. Boom. Cool. Thanks, guys. Uh, so just to recap, uh, Season 3 delivers private matches and seasonal crucible rankings to every player of Destiny 2. Uh, we're also delivering the new crucible maps that we're releasing with Warmind. You'll be able to enjoy those in matchmaking. If you want to use them in private matches, you do need to own the expansion. So as they depart uh, toward this new match, uh, I'd like to introduce you to the final wave of developers that are in the hot seats. We final boss. Final, our <laughs> final bosses for the day are John Wesniewski. Morning. Morning. And Josh Hamrick. Hello. Uh, you uh, probably have seen these two gentlemen talking about their work on many occasions past, <laughs> whether it's a bounty or a video or a stream like this. So um, we are going to be talking about <laughs> the uh, sandbox tuning for Season 3. Uh, this live fire exercise in the Crucible will be a great opportunity for us to look at how exotic weapons are all becoming just a little bit more exotic. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to us a little bit about what your goals have been in reaching into the sandbox and making some of the most uh, coveted weapons a little bit more dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, the big goals that we were trying to hit with the, uh, the exotic weapon pass that, that is going to be going live in May is that um, we wanted to increase the feeling of exoticness or power or uh, sort of a specific gameplay experience that was happening with each exotic weapon. Basically, with the focus of just making everything stronger, faster, better, um, just pushing everything uh, a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. um, and we wanted to do that in a way that was leaning into the exotic fantasy or the gameplay that we'd already established with the weapons on release. Okay. So we weren't trying to make any like drastic changes to how these thought. things play. If you already know how they play, if you already like them, or if there's one that like you feel like it could be better, but it just needs a little something, um, that gameplay is still going to be pretty familiar to you. It's just going um, to be a lot more effective, hopefully, in, in every activity that you like playing. Okay. Well, my fighting lion that you see here is now a beast. And John can tell you everything it does, but uh, it is my... One of my personal favorites. I've been running it like crazy in playtests. Yeah, the uh, the thing we did to Fighting Lion to, to make it a little bit better is we, we gave it more ammo, um, and we've we basically did a, a small adjustment to how damage works on it. So um, we we added more damage to the detonation and took a little bit off the impact. So it places a little less um, pressure on trying to get that grenade to hit and makes the detonation a little bit more friendly. Let you reach out and touch people. Like yeah. That. It just makes it a little bit more reliable. Um, oh my god, it's fun. That was some hot potato action for me just now. This design pass, did it include all of the exotic weapons, or did you pick some very specific targets that you wanted to focus on? Almost all of them. There's only a handful that didn't get touched, um, and because those, we felt those ones were already playing pretty well or already getting relatively positive feedback from, mm -hmm. uh, from the community. Um, and because we did have a limited amount of time, we wanted to make sure we were hitting all the stuff that really needed a, a good pass. Yeah. yeah. So if uh, Fighting Line is one that you're really enjoying, Josh, uh, mm -hmm. John, what are you looking forward to getting your hands on when the uh, one two zero update kicks off Season 3? Uh, I'm really excited about the Graviton Lance. I know we talked about it a whole bunch, but um, I think that one just came together really nicely. I think it's going to be a, a, a really good weapon for all activities. Um, yeah, it's going to be great. I think it'll, it'll definitely, in the PvP world, it'll definitely give Vigilance Wing a run for its money, okay. for sure. Well, we are in the PvP world right now, so maybe we can see uh, a little bit of Graviton Lance. Oh, another thing, uh, <sighs> while I remember, another thing we did to Fighting Lion mm -hmm. to make it a little bit, bit better is if you are still, f it just has more ammo now, if you are still feeling some ammo pressure, um, if you get a kill with the grenade, it guarantees a special ammo, uh, or sorry, a, an energy ammo brick to drop. Cool.
Do we have any good snipers we could watch? <laughs> oh. Damn. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. You're go take a seat, Captain. All right, fine. Oh, well, that wasn't it. <laughs> Switch something out. Yeah, you, you should. You should. Uh, We've got what? Risk Runner. What did you do to Risk Runner? Risk Runner? Um, so currently Risk Runner, when you take arc damage, you're resistant to arc damage, mm -hmm. and it activates um, the, uh, the arc overdrive perk where, the, where basically the gun comes to your life and just like blasts everything with electrical energy. Um, we increased the amount of arc damage resistance you get when the weapon activates, and then we enabled that for PvP. So now you can run Risk Runner. Yeah. If you get hit with arc damage in PvP, you will take half damage from the arc source. Um, it will turn on the arc damage or the arc overdrive perk, making the weapon way more lethal. Um, and then another thing we did is that we allowed the arc overdrive perk to enable when you have it stowed. So you don't have to have it out. Mm -hmm. um, if you have the weapon backpacked and you take arc damage, it's going to turn on. You're going to get a notification like, hey, it's party time. Time to pull out Risk Runner, ready to go. Party time. But important distinction for the PvP players is that you only get the damage resistance when the weapon is in your hand. Okay. So the perk can activate when you take damage, but you have to pull it out to be able to get the damage resistance. Second match is coming up. We're going to play some Clash. Map settings being tweaked. Mm -hmm. uh, saw that uh, Skyburner's Oath mm -hmm. had been equipped. Yeah. Uh, Skyburner's Oath is, uh, has actually been a favorite of mine. I've used it in Crucible, which is rare for me to use a scout in Crucible. Mm -hmm. um, what have you done to my baby? <laughs> this got the most, probably one of the biggest changes. Yeah, right? it took a long time. It took a long time to like really dial in how the projectile was going to work. But basically, um, we talked about this in the TWAB a little bit ago, but Skyburner's Oath had, sorry. I'm kidding, I'm, sorry. I'm, just, kidding. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. It's, uh, an, it's an inside joke, it's an inside joke. <laughs> Skyburner's Oath had um, it had a relatively uh, like good amount of utility and power. It was a pretty strong weapon. It just didn't have any spectacle. Like it, like you, when you used it, it just sort of felt like one of the other legendary guns. Even yeah. though it was pretty strong, it was pretty effective for, yeah. for most activities. Yeah. Um, and so we just kind of wanted to give it some sparkle, some pizzazz. Uh, and and so what we did is um, we sort of like looked at the the duality nature of the weapon, where it fires fast from hip and then fires slow when you ADS. Um, and we just sort of like, okay, let's make a more distinctive uh, separation here between hip fire and, and aiming down sights. Um, so now aiming down sights is going to behave like it did, fire slow, high impact, precision damage. We put um, explosive rounds on the weapon, so anytime you hit with any play style, it's going to explode and do some damage. Um, but then for the hip fire, what we did is we, we slowed down the projectiles and we sort of like put a little bit of gravity on them, so mm -hmm. you're kind of lobbing these, like, yeah. almost feels like a rapid-fire grenade launcher. Okay. Um, and then we put some... The, the, the first attempt at doing that was like, okay, this is fun. Like, I, it's, I can see the sort of the, the feeling of, of how this is going to work, but it was pretty hard to actually, like, hit targets with a slower projectile. So we're like, screw it, man. We're, we're trying to make exotics strong and awesome. Let's put some tracking on this thing so you kind of don't have to aim all that much. <laughs> Target seeking yeah. rounds. Yep. All and right. The, the first version of that was strong. Is it insane. <laughs> Show me those targets. That's really rounds. strong. That's nasty. And, uh, it that would is. track yeah. you down. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Look at that. That is awesome. I, that's going to be fun, man. Um, that is going to be fun. Yeah, definitely great to like. Like how Kevin's using it here, um, it's a really fun weapon to use uh, as a warlock. It's sort of you're like strafing yeah, through the air, the air, you're sort of yeah. raining fire, almost like you're some kind of sky burner. Oh <laughs> God! Look, there at, it look is. at that. Have wow. fun with your puns. Wow. Have um, fun with your grown-worthy puns. Oh, oh you got caught what up. was that? That was hard light. And what have you done to hard light? Hard light. Um, we we basically gave it the same functionality that Borealis has now, where you can hold down. The, <laughs> <laughs> you can hold down the reload button. Um, to change damage types on the fly. Okay. Um, and then we did something that uh, I'm really excited about. Um, so one of the one of the things that people know and love about hard light, of course, as you can see there, is yep. that it bounces willy nilly all over the place. Indeed. Um, the utility of that is not super strong. Um, it's there's a lot of spectacle there. It feels like a laser light show, but trying to actually pull something off with that has been difficult. So what we did is. With hard light now, every time a bullet ricochets, it gets double damage. So 
if you're bouncing stuff around the corner, you're going to be doing twice as much damage. A little bit harder to hit, yep. but yep. when you Pays do get the out. hits, it's going to pay off. Blind yeah. firing, yeah. high risk reward. And I am really excited to see what kind of montage material we can get from people uh, doing trick shots, bounce yeah. shots, like shooting at the ground in front of somebody to have it bounce up and, and hit them and then melt them instantly. Right. Well, as excited. much as I'm loving the uh, Skyburner's Oath exhibition here, um, I'm wondering if we can get, as much as you've talked about Graviton Lance, I wonder if we can get a Graviton Lance equipped on that character. Thank you so much. This is going to be disgusting. Okay. Kevin's and why will, this these be guys. why will this be disgusting? <laughs> it's just good. Like We, we use the power of math to uh, make sure the, the time to kill on Graviton is pretty competitive. So, okay. yeah. Yeah, time to kill has been a uh, frequent topic of conversation yeah. in our community. How does Graviton Lance specifically answer that question? You said the power of math. You're just um, making this weapon more yeah. lethal, more power. Well, look at that. Money. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, um, so one of the things we did to Graviton is we made it a, a two-round burst instead of a three-round burst. So the first bullet's a little bit weaker. Uh -huh. and the second bullet is much stronger with a, with a little bit harder kick. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's one bullet less that you have to fire, so it's already got a competitive advantage Yikes. against other pulse rifles. Mm -hmm. um, and as as we were making these changes uh, for May, um, changes were also happening in tandem for uh, the Go Fast update, mm -hmm. which we released a little bit ago. Yeah. And as most people know, pulse rifles got a significant buff. And when those changes sort of like rolled our Came way together. and we yeah. play tested, we were like holy crap, this thing's amazing. And then it was sort of one of those moments where like, do we change it? Do we keep it? What do we do? We're like, screw it. Plays great. People love it. We're just going to keep it. So yeah, Pulse Rifle buff made yeah. this thing pretty awesome. Um, and yeah, we're just going to let it roll, see how it goes. For the first three years of Destiny, uh, you know, we presided over a lot of conversations about certain weapons being OP. Certain weapons had reigns of terror throughout yep. the course of uh, you know, different sandbox updates. Uh, with Destiny 2, a lot of the feedback has been nothing's OP. Yeah. And they wanted some of those rough edges to come back. Yep. Uh, looks like you're doing that. Yep, absolutely. Speaking of rate of fire changes and things like that, Crimson? Crimson, yeah. Crimson's getting better. Um, Crimson is not necessarily going to have a flashy update like Skyburner. Mm -hmm. uh, if you know how to use Crimson, it's going to be... It's going to play the same. It. It's going to be very yeah. consistent. Oh, no. Um, what we did to make Crimson a more competitive option for PvP... Oh, and just for, for the whole game, the first thing we did... <laughs> was, Watch uh, the taunts. <laughs> one, of the, one of the biggest uh, pieces of feedback about Crimson was that I run out of ammo too fast. So we addressed that. We gave it a whole bunch more ammo. Um, uh, and there it is now. For, for the competitive world, um, we basically looked at Crimson as... Uh, we want to try and match the time to kill of an aggressive family hand cannon, mm -hmm. which is three shots at the head. Um, it was interesting trying to solve that because Crimson is a three round burst and it also, the burst fires a little bit slower than a pulse rifle because we wanted to make it still feel like a hand cannon. We actually tried it um, early on in Curse of Osiris. We tried firing Crimson as a, a three round burst like the sidearm and it just made it feel really light yep. and sort of like... Mm -hmm. It felt like you were using a sidearm with funny art. Yeah, it did um, not feel like a hand. Yeah. <laughs> so we actually, like, we, we increased the damage on the bullets and then slowed down the burst, so it really felt a little bit Ooh. chunky. Um, but anyways, trying to match the, uh, the exact time to kill to an aggressive hand cannon um, meant doing some, some specific tuning to precision damage and uh, basically the rate of fire. So we slowed down, or sorry, we sped up the... Uh, <laughs> Everyone saw yeah. that coming. We sped up the time between bursts to be able to match the cadence of an aggressive hand cannon, and then to be able to match the exact time in shots to kill, um, we had to make it so that the first bullet of the final burst is the killing blow of Crimson. So, uh, because it fires free bullets. three rounds per burst, you actually have a lot of room for error there, so you can afford to get in some body shots or miss a couple rounds, um, and you'll still be competitive with aggressive hand cannons. Yeah. Cool. If you were uh, to place a bet, uh, what uh, what gun do you think is going to be a standout? Uh oh, here it comes. Yeah. Are you going to go to Sturm? <laughs> You're not going to go Rat King? All right, your choice. Your choice. We're talking about hand cannons. Let's see if we can get some of those crispy two taps. Cri give me give me some crispy two taps. <laughs> uh, not bad. 
There Not we go. So he's got it primed. He's now got a primed overcharge bullet, which oh, means he can get it. a two shot kill if he doesn't miss. So how this one is going to work is Sturm and Drang are paired weapons. Mm -hmm. um, there it is. There it is. Uh, so you get a kill with Drang. It automatically... Oh, you're just so <laughs> bored with yourself. You're just so awesome. You're so bored with yourself. Getting a kill with Drang automatically reloads Sturm, and it adds one bonus round to the magazine. Um, a new uh, functionality with Sturm is that any overloaded round, so Sturm has a default magazine of 12, and goes up to 20, mm -hmm. so rounds from 12 to 20 are going to have a significant amount, significant amount of bonus damage. Um, but you only need one. But you only need one overcharged round plus one normal round no. shots to the head to get a kill in Crucible. And then in the PvE world, you can get kills with Drang all day, overload Sturm up to 20 rounds. Mm -hmm. Uh, and be sitting pretty. Yeah. All right. Well, those are the two Crucible matches that we were going to play today. Uh, some, some good pearls there about the exotic weapon tuning. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't need to reveal every single detail on stream. No. Uh, might as well, uh, you know, we do love watching our exotic weapon reviews uh, from our community, and uh, that will be a good opportunity for us to understand if we've uh, gotten closer to the sweet spot. Uh, we'd love to hear your opinions about these exotic weapons. You'll have an opportunity to get your hands on them on May 8th, when Season 3 begins with the launch of Warmind, the second expansion to Destiny 2. Any parting comments about your work and what you hope you'll see in Season 3, gentlemen? Uh, I'm, just, I'm genuinely excited. I, it, was, it was joy working on this, like just making everything a little bit cooler and a little bit better. Uh, I can't wait for people to uh, get their hands on it, and um, if it's not good enough, let us know. Yeah. Do another pass. Hopefully it is. Looking forward to the videos that come out. We also finished fixing the sniper scope bug, and so snipers out there, like, your time is, has arrived. Super excited about the montages and stuff that will show up. Cool. Yeah, and all this. So, yeah. All right. Well, this, uh, this begins a larger conversation about Warmind and Season 3. That conversation will continue. Uh, we'll continue to give you uh, a glimpse at how some of the different exotic weapons are changing. Uh, we'll give uh, some different developer insights for some of the activities that we've revealed today. And uh, we've still got a couple of weeks to set expectations about all of this. So we thank you for tuning in. We thank you for watching. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you play Warmind. We're looking forward to bumping into you out in the wild as we play some Escalation Protocol. And of course, there's an entire new campaign, an entire new story to tell. And I uh, hope we haven't spoiled too much of that for you. Uh, I'm Deej from Bungie. It's been my pleasure to host today, and we'll begin this conversation again soon. Guardians aren't supposed to investigate their past. That's the rule. But I'm not good with rules. Not when there's this much at stake. The Clovis Bray tech in that building allowed us to colonize the system during the Golden Age. We, they, sought to create peace for all humanity. Which is ironic, because they also built Rasputin, the single most powerful weapon in the solar system. Either way, it's all been entombed on Mars since the collapse. Along with something far more terrifying.